Good morning. It's nice to see you this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray that this morning, as we turn our attention to your word, that you might address us. You know the things that have been happening in each of our lives, the things that occupy our minds and our hearts at this moment. You know the pressures that are upon us. You know the joys and the sorrows. Father, we pray that you might take all distractions from us and enable us to hear what you have to say. Would you mend hearts through your word? Would you challenge us as we need to be challenged? And would you guide and direct us that we might live as faithful disciples of the Lord Jesus? For we ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. Friends, would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 26? Matthew 26, and let me read to you uh, the brief paragraph from verse 47. Matthew 26, starting at verse 47. While Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came from the high priests and the elders of the people, and with him a great crowd with swords and sticks. And the one who betrayed him had given them a sign, saying, Whoever I kiss, he is the one, arrest him. And straight away, as he approached Jesus, he said, Greetings, teacher, and he kissed him. Then they came, laid hands on Jesus, and arrested him. And one of those who was with Jesus reached out and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest on his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place, for all who take up the sword will be destroyed by the sword. Or do you think I am unable to call my father, and he would right now set for me twelve legions of angels? But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, do you come to capture me with swords and sticks as if I were a robber? Each day I sat in the temple teaching and you did not arrest me. This is entirely so that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. And they all abandoned him and fled. There are a number of things uh, that strike you when you first visit Jerusalem. One is the way the old city uh, is very literally built on the top of a hill. Another is the number of graves uh, that are built into the side of that hill. Orthodox Jews, um, convinced that Jerusalem will be the site of the Messiah's arrival, have wanted to be buried there so that they'll be amongst the first to rise and greet him. Another is the extent to which 2,000 years of tourists and pilgrims have left their mark. Deep grooves in pathways and steps, shrines and souvenir shops everywhere and churches built to just about every conceivable point in the gospel story. But one other thing, something that uh, Simon Gillam has reminded me of lately, is how visible the path down from the city is when you're standing in the Kidron Valley, in the Garden of Gethsemane, especially if you were standing there at night. And a band of around 200 men with torches, and swords and sticks were making their way down the hill, you would have been able to see them coming from a long way away. You would have heard them. Though we might not know exactly the number Judas brought with him on the night before Jesus' death, it is described as a great crowd. It wasn't just three or four. So blazing torches, clinking metal, the noise of conversation, some quiet, some not so quiet, this was no stealth raid. There was no radio silence, no night goggles, no just hand signals of where to go. <laughs> These people had been sent from the religious and political leaders of the city. They had no reason to hide and their guide had assured them they would find their quarry and they would have been visible at a distance. He knew they were coming. What this underlines is what is crystal clear in all four accounts of Jesus' arrest in the garden. Jesus was entirely in control that night. He could have avoided them. He could have overcome them. 
Even 200 men are not a match for 12 legions of angels. He could easily have withstood them. This is, after all, the man who banished demons, stilled the storm, raised the dead. John's account tells us that when Jesus identified himself to the crowd, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. They were no match for Jesus alone either. Or seeing them coming, he could have fled, just as the disciples did at the end of this passage. But he did not flee. He did not resist. He surrendered himself. And he did that in full knowledge of what was coming next. Just moments before, he'd been praying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But the arrival of this band, led by Judas made clear it was not possible, not if the scripture was to be fulfilled, not if you and I were to be saved. As we arrive at uh, this moment in Matthew's account of Jesus' ministry, so many things are concentrated in these few verses. The perversity of sin, the weakness of human beings, the calm resolution of Jesus, the unbreakable certainty of scripture. And we need to face each of these things face on, especially in a world that waters down the perversity of sin, that refuses to recognise the weakness of human beings, that undermines the calm resolution of Jesus and questions with increasing volume and insistence the prophetic testimony of Scripture. As the pace quickens here in Matthew's Gospel, we need to understand what is now here out in the open for all to see. The passage can be boiled down to two brief but monumental sentences when you think about it. Then they came, laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. And, and they all abandoned him and fled. Both of those statements are extraordinary, aren't they? When the Son of God stands there in the garden with his ragtag band of disciples, they lay hands on him and arrest him. Herod had not been able to lay hands on Jesus as a baby in Bethlehem. Luke tells us that the enraged crowd were not able to lay hands on him after he'd preached in a synagogue in Nazareth. He passed through their midst and went away. But here in the dark, in the garden, they laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. What was different about this time? Why were they able to do that now? Then at the end of the paragraph, they all abandoned him and fled. Something we'll need to come back to, the monumental weakness of these men and of us all. But do you really think that you would have done anything different if you'd been there? This morning, I want to look at this brief passage under those four headings, the perversity of sin, the weakness of human beings, the calm resolution of Jesus, and the unbreakable certainty of the scriptures. So first, the perversity of sin. Matthew almost falls over himself, emphasising how perverse were the actions of Judas that night. He does that in three ways. See how he is introduced. Judas, one of the twelve. He was not one of the opponents of Jesus. He was not someone with an axe to grind because Jesus had snubbed him or exposed him to ridicule. Judas was one of the twelve that Jesus had chosen out of the large group of those who followed him to be one of his closest companions. He was one of those Jesus had chosen to mentor, to teach, to explain what he was doing. Time and again, Jesus had spoken to performed miracles in front of the crowds, but it was only with these twelve that he explained what was going on, and one of them was Judas. Judas. Judas was one of those who'd walked with Jesus throughout his ministry, one of those who reclined with him at the Last Supper. He shared the dipping bowl with Jesus. What extraordinary privilege had been extended to this man to walk with, to learn from the Word made flesh, the Son sent from the Father. But that night, this man, one of the twelve, came from the high priest and the elders of the people with a great crowd carrying swords and sticks. And it's meant to strike you as something almost unbelievable. 
it was one of the 12 that led the mob to Jesus that night. The second time that uh, Judas is described in these verses is even more telling. Matthew doesn't even use his name this time. He simply says, the one who betrayed him. And we know about betrayal, don't we? Where trust has been given and it gets trampled into the dust, many of us will have experienced that on one level or another. The betrayal of a close friend, the betrayal of a trusted Christian elder, the betrayal of a marriage partner. And if you haven't, I'm pretty sure you know someone who has. And you'll have some idea of how devastating that is. This relationship was not meant to go like that. Jesus had given this man his life. After all, Jesus is the one by whom, through whom and for whom all things were made. He had called him to new life. We don't actually have a record of that first encounter, but like all the others, he must have heard Jesus say, come, follow me. And he'd been entrusted with a ministry of eternal significance. He went out with the other 11 on that brief mission throughout Galilee. He'd seen Jesus raise Jairus' daughter, the widow of Nain's son, Lazarus. But that night, the only thing that can be said about Judas is that he is the one who betrayed him. Somehow, at some point in the previous few months, Jesus, Judas, sorry, Judas had decided that what he would gain from the chief priests and elders was worth betraying Jesus. In some kind of perverse, twisted thinking, he valued partnership with them more than he valued discipleship with Jesus. And I've watched people embrace that kind of thinking. Have you? Something, perhaps someone, is worth more than discipleship with Jesus, worth more than trusting his word and living for him. Sin always involves believing a lie. Sometimes it's the lie that this thing, this behaviour won't do any harm. And sometimes it's the lie that this thing or this experience or this opportunity is better than faith and obedience. And it's always a lie, no matter how good it looks from the outside. So don't be fooled, will you? Don't be fooled. There's nothing in this world. There's nothing this world can offer. No possession, no position, no person who is worth pursuing instead of Jesus. Whatever it was that attracted Judas, and surely it couldn't have been just 30 pieces of silver, the price of a damaged slave in the Old Testament. Judas believed it was worth betraying Jesus. And uh, the third indication of how perverse sin really is, is the way Judas does it, with a kiss. A sign of affection, a respect, an indication of relationship, what, what the observer might conclude is kindness, or a token of their closeness, yet we know that under the cover of an act of kindness, there was that sign that this is the one, it sees him. It is insincere, it's ironic. Just as in the beginning of the gospel, Herod the Great had told the wise men from the east that he wanted to worship Jesus, when really he wanted to murder him. So here at this end of the gospel, Judas pretends to offer respect and kindness and is in that very act handing him over to people who will kill him. You see, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, not everyone who approaches with a kiss is someone who genuinely trusts Jesus. We live in a context, don't we, uh, where there is immense confusion about sin. The devil's lie is that this way of living, this perspective, this set of commitments, this permission is far more valuable and rewarding than following Jesus and that is being believed by more and more people. The devil is very skilled at making the fruit on the tree look good for food, a delight to the eyes and to be desired to make one wise. He's been doing it for a very long time. 
But that promise is hollow, empty, wicked and perverse. It always is. Just like the sin that was enacted that night with a kiss. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy, as Proverbs reminds us. Well, secondly, the weakness of human beings. The perversity of sin, the weakness of human beings. You see it there, don't you, in the, that pathetic moment with the swords. John actually dobs Peter in as the one who did it all. How unsurprising. The man who all through the Gospels shoots off his mouth and needs to be corrected. The man who made profuse declarations of devotion. Even if they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And in the heat of the moment, here in some futile attempt to ward off 200 men single-handed, in that contrast to Jesus who stands there calmly, Peter lashes out. And once again, Jesus needs to correct him. Put your sword in its place, for all who take up the sword will be destroyed by the sword. It's not a call for pacifism, but it is certainly a stark warning that Jesus' victory will not be won by human might or force. Far too often in Christian history, leaders have forgotten those words of Jesus. Religious wars, crusades purges and inquisitions, none of them have furthered the kingdom. You might at best be able to force conformity on the outside, but without the work of God's spirit in the heart, you cannot bring people into the kingdom. This strange incident in, in the middle of the arrest scene provided the occasion for Jesus to warn about the use of force in connection with his kingdom. All kinds of force. It's the word of the gospel that is the engine of kingdom growth, not the sword or the law or sheer force of personality. In the early years of the Reformation, it was Luther who pointed out most clearly that people are not won to Christ by force, but by persuasion through the word. The word must do the work. And if we try to force the issue in any other way, it will end badly. Those who take up the sword will be destroyed by the sword. It will not work. And we will eventually discover just how weak our show of force was in reality. The other Gospels show us how weak this particular show of force was in reality. Jesus had to intervene and undo the damage done by Peter. Jesus healed the injury to the servant, whose name we're told is Malchus. And most likely that mattered to the early church because they knew who Malchus was. And Jesus rebuked Peter. The gesture that Peter made was as empty as his words of undying loyalty. And it got worse. By the end of this scene, Jesus' own words from earlier that night were fulfilled. He quoted Zechariah 13, you might remember. You will all fall away because of me this night, for it's written, I'll strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And after they laid hands on Jesus and arrested him, and after Jesus addressed the crowd that surrounded him, they all abandoned him and fled. Despite their protests, they'd all echoed Peter's words when he swore he would never abandon him. They fled for their lives. Earlier, they could not stay awake in the garden. Now they could not stand by him when it mattered. As one writer puts it, in these verses, the 12 are utter failures. One of them betrays Jesus, another vainly takes up the sword to return evil for evil, and all finally forsake Jesus and flee. Betrayal, violence and cowardice. Could you imagine how it must have felt for the early, earliest disciples when every time the gospel is proclaimed, they hear these words, they all forsook him and fled. But as I asked earlier, do you really think that if you had been there, you would act differently. But this was more than just human weakness, pathetic as it was. In God's plan to save us fully, completely, effectively, Jesus had to be alone that night. And while that aloneness displayed so vividly the weakness of his disciples, it also displayed Jesus' unshakable resolve. So thirdly, the calm resolution of Jesus. 
It'd been evident throughout that night, not my will, but yours be done, he had prayed. But it's evident here as Jesus addresses each of the main, main players in the scene. As Judas, one of the twelve, the one who betrayed him, approached and kissed him, Jesus fr said, friend, do what you came to do. He'd known about Judas's betrayal all along. And he'd still taken him to Jerusalem. He'd still shared the Passover with him. John tells us that after Judas had taken the bread from Jesus' hand at that Passover meal, after Satan had entered him, Jesus whispered to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. None of it was a surprise to Jesus. When the rattling was heard through the trees in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the light of the torches was seen snaking its way down the path, Jesus was under no illusion about who was at the head of the pack, leading them to him. He knew, and he did not back away. When Peter makes his futile gesture, lashing out, proving how loyal he was, how brave he was, just moments before he ran away, and then came back to the courtyard to deny Jesus three times, Jesus again showed his calm resolution. Who was in control? The one who swung the sword or the one who told him to put it away? Jesus was certainly not outgunned that night. It wasn't that his opponents had a stronger force. He certainly wasn't going to his death because he didn't have enough protection. He could have been immediately surrounded by 12 legions of angels, a legion for each of the disciples, 72,000 soldiers in all, if he'd just asked. The devil had been right in the wilderness all those years before. The angels in heaven were at his command, but he did not command and he did not ask. He was determined to do his father's will. Neither disciples nor angels must get in the way of that. Jesus was totally in control, even at this point. At the point where it seems he'd been trapped and was overcome by superior might of those in authority in Jerusalem, he did not flinch. It must happen this way. And then when he addressed the crowd, those who'd come to him with swords and sticks, a show of force and a foretaste of what was to come, once again you see it. Why have you come to capture me with swords and sticks as if I were a robber? You had your chance every single day in the temple. If you have nothing to hide, if right is on your side, if you're really acting with integrity, why didn't you do it out in the open, right there in front of the people? And everyone on every side knows why. What they did that night, this raiding party, this arresting force, was said more about them than it said about Jesus. But there was a deeper reason. Jesus made clear that even the way they did it was a necessary fulfilment of the words of the prophets, the writings of the prophets. They had written he would be despised. They had written he would be treated like a criminal. They had written that he would be alone and that in that aloneness he would do what no one else could do. This is where his ministry had been heading all along. And he did not resile from it. Brothers and sisters, Jesus was determined to rescue you. It wasn't a spur of the moment decision. It wasn't a take it or leave it proposition. The angel had told Joseph way back in the beginning, he will save his people from their sins. He had predicted throughout these last months of his earthly ministry in increasing detail what lay ahead for him in Jerusalem. And in torchlight, in the garden, he was calmly resolved to do all that was necessary to fulfil the scriptures, to do the will of his Father, to save you. And isn't that an extraordinary comfort? That in the turmoil of that night, one man stood firm and he is the man who was there for you, for me. So finally, the unbreakable certainty of the scriptures. Threaded through this account of those last hours, just as it has been threaded through the entire gospel, is this note that Jesus is the fulfilment of God's promises, all God's promises. Here it's the betrayal by a friend, 
just as David had foretold in Psalm 41, the scattering of the sheep at the moment the shepherd was struck, as Zechariah had written in Zechariah 13. Jesus' words about the use of the sword echo Genesis 9. Whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed. And Jesus himself made clear twice that this, what this was all about. Verse 54, if he had sought the protection of the angels, then how would the scripture be fulfilled? That it must be so. And in verse 56, but this is entirely so that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. You and I know that what happened in the garden was not a misadventure, not recklessness, it was not a miscalculation on the part of Jesus and the disciples. Peter would say on the day of Pentecost, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. This has been on view from the beginning and from before the beginning. And when this word was spoken or written, it was unbreakable. It must be this way, Jesus said. He knew it was not possible for this cup to pass from him. It has all come together and come together in this precise way so that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. The whole of scripture finds its centre in what happened in this and the next few hours. And it is sure, certain and unbreakable. The perversity of sin, the weakness of human beings, the calm resolution of Jesus and the unbreakable certainty of the scriptures. All this is on display in this little scene played out in the garden, looking up at Jerusalem on one side and the Mount of Olives on the other. Yet all this is overturned in the headlong rush of our world and its gatekeepers of public opinion into confusion and turmoil. But I'm brought back to that observation that Simon made. He saw them coming. He saw them when they were still quite a way off. If I'd seen them coming, I would have run or found a place to hide. I wouldn't have stayed around to confront them. Not that many. Not when they're armed. Not when it's clear they're hostile. Not if I knew what was in their hearts. It would have been terrifying and my heart would have been beating harder with every minute. Jesus was the son united in term determination with the Father and the Spirit, but he was also at the same time one of us who learned obedience through what he suffered. It would have been terrifying for him too, and his heart would have been beating harder with every minute. And yet he stood there until they came. He endured the humiliation of Judas's hypocritical kiss. He watched the pathetic attempt of Peter to demonstrate his courage and he saw them all run away. But there was no other way to save us. And so he surrendered himself to those who'd come for him. You mattered that much. Your sin mattered that much. And he loved that much. The time had come for the Son of Man to be betrayed into the hands of sinners, as Jesus had said just a moment or two earlier. But the really wonderful thing is that this was all for sinners. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we have so much to thank you for. We thank you for Jesus' determination to save those you've given to him. And we rejoice in the salvation that is ours. Would you help us to live as those who have so been saved? For we ask it of you in Jesus' name.